So we're doing documentary here, All right. right? And uh, you're selling some comments and stuff like that. I just want to know what you think. Nothing happens anyway. There's no change anyway. So you can do 10 documentaries. Ain't gonna change nothing. So what's the difference? We were filming when Lonnie cut in. So we gave him his say. So what's the documentary about? Making things happen? No, the documentary is about a retreat that these guys and I go on to talk about black history, leadership skills, and issues that's facing them and stopping them from becoming to doing things that they want to do. They sit here and do documentaries, do this and that, mm -hmm. but what's it doing for the brothers? Yeah. Now that summer camp thing you yeah. said, that's right on, right? Uh, but besides that, I can't see no, you know, no change since I've been growing up in here for the last 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. I find I'm going a little bit crazy And I'm getting ready to smoke you and your baby These niggas think it's a joke, do not provoke me Cause I will come through and hit you with this smoke, see? If you had to do some of the programming of this retreat What would you, what would you uh, do? Well, just, uh, you know, show, show the black youth that there is, you know, more out there than You know, <laughs> crime and stuff like that right, right. Show them positive things All they hear is the bad stuff Right. You need people around here that fills your head with positivity, mm -hmm. and then, you know, maybe when they grow up, they will be positive instead of negative. Okay. You know what I'm saying? I'm that nigga who is violent. I like to keep my shit tight, but I am kind of silent. Don't get me rowdy, because I will get bowdy. And you niggas, you know you niggas can't doubt me. So who wants some of this cannibalistic MC? Y'all niggas are like a feast of me, because I feed off your negative energy. Bradley's only 15. He's my fiance's half brother. Your lyrics are pretty explicit. So where are they coming from? Hate. He's a hard kid, but he has a good heart. What about like your hardness? Where, where does that come from? Like why? Why do you feel that you have to be hard? It ain't that I have to be hard. It's just that I am hard. Mm -hmm. and there ain't nothing I can do to change that. So I know that you carry some stuff or whatever, right? Like what? What do you carry to protect yourself? So why do you feel that you have to carry that? Too many enemies. I was helping to organize a retreat for young black men, some of them in trouble, like Bradley. He said he'd be there. So what we're gonna do is uh, this, this is cool, and uh, we'll we'll hook up and uh, go. So you're definitely gonna go though, right? I'm going. Okay, cool. I was hoping to get him onto a new road, but he didn't come. He just wasn't ready to change. Well, what we're doing is looking for mentors, the people that talk about this particular issue. Saying, if oh, you want to go, to come. I'll uh, get you the forms and stuff and give you information. And if you want to go, right. you go. I'll be more than welcome to come yeah. and help. Lonnie didn't show up either. Young black men don't get a lot of chances to make positive connections with the older generation. The retreat brought together 30 young guys and 10 mentors from across Nova Scotia. A lot of us grew up in a negative climate. The retreat was the first step in showing these guys they can do something positive for themselves. I met Corey Lucas only a few days ago. He had some tough times and made some bad choices, but he's ambitious and open to change. And now he's 21 and a father. In my early 20s, I took part in a conference called Black Men Survive in the 90s. The men I met gave me the support I needed to succeed. They helped me to become a mentor. And now I was about to become a different kind of role model. My fiance Melissa was pregnant with twins. The day I heard their heartbeats was the most emotional day of my life but Melissa went into labor much too early. Although I got to hold them in my arms, our baby girls couldn't survive. It made me realize how precious life really is. I helped organize a retreat with the Brothers Reaching Out Society. Some say these youth are at risk, but I think all youth are at risk. 
Robert Upshaw came as a mentor. He has a real talent for relating to youth. Now the first workshop we're calling leadership development. Workshop number one, and that's my, my workshop here. Basically, there's one objective, and you should always have an objective. What does that mean, objective? A goal set. A goal set, a reason. So this is our purpose for the next 40 minutes. Our purpose is to discover what is leadership. Y'all be, should be shouting the answers out. We need to hear you. Get involved, you know what I'm saying? This is all about you guys. Looking for solutions. Seriously, that's, that's good. Green. B. B. See, black people can spell. We are so prone to react to a, cir a circumstance that might tick us off. We want to clean somebody's clock. We got to stop doing that. We count. So let's show that we have education. As soon as you are born, you begin the process of dying. We're going to pass. So what we're trying to do is pass on what we know to you. Speak, brother. That's what we hear about. Just leadership skills. To me, a leadership skills is for somebody that recognizes a problem. I heard people use an expression say, natural leader. There's no such thing. You come here with the same equal ability. It's how well it's nurtured. I find that I'm a pretty good leader myself. But then, start writing. All right. It's not about, you know, okay, I'm not be a great leader one day. It's just taking those small little steps, and then next thing you know, someone calls you leader, and you don't even realize you are, right? All right, do I have a group that would like to volunteer first to do present? Ambition. Ambition is the key. You can't wait for somebody to hand you something. You gotta go get that. If I see a job out there and I'm finna get it, I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna seize the moment, I'm gonna get my, my what? My resume in there, I'm gonna get my cover letter, I'm gonna get all my qualifications, everything. Reference letters, I'm gonna get that job. That's like Cop DM, season the moment. I admired Corey. I wasn't trying to convince him to change. He realized he was being given an opportunity. Just coming to the retreat was a big step. Corey has taken a lot of steps since Sopaz Benjamin met him a few years ago. I remember the first day when I met Corey, actually, it was sort of like I thought, you know, oh, this guy's, you know, a little cocky. The superficial gut reaction was like, you know, some just very smooth guy just trying to, you know, has obviously character and personality, you know, is he, is, is he, what is he about? Is he about using that character and personality just to get ahead? Don't hit the camera. I quickly realized there was something more there. Corey's a young man, he's only, I think, about 21, and he has a three-year-old son. Hey. Who you be doing on, Daddy Zare? <laughs> I know that he struggled, and I think maybe even to a certain extent still struggles with. The question that we all struggle with, who am I? Oh, who are you still throwing balls? You know, am I, am I this typical kind of young, you know, hip-hop, no responsibility type of person? Or am I this uh, domesticated family man? Am I that person? Because I think for him, those two identities contradict each other and do not coexist. I always want to succeed from my mother. I want my mother to feel as if she did something good. I didn't want to let my mother down. When I brought a uh, report card home and it was saying that I was doing good, my mother's face lit up like a light bulb. And every time I saw that response, it influenced me to be to do better. Corey grew up in a public housing project outside Halifax. Welcome to Jelly Bean Square. That was a nice neighborhood to bring your kids up in. All the families, there's no color because we're all poor. <laughs> we're all just struggling, right? If my child wasn't at my house, I knew he was at his friend's house down the road. They all hung together. They were tight. I lived in these two spots. Yeah. But I got more of my memories in number nine, though. 
when he walked up the house when he was younger. Who you going with? Where you gonna go at? Uh, when you coming back? Who you hanging with? Mom, why you gotta know all my business? I gotta know your business because guess what? If there's one person in this world that's gonna come looking for your little behind when you don't come home, it's me. Can you back up a bit? <laughs> What's your name is? Kylie. <laughs> when I look at my son, I'm like, man, that's me. That's a piece of me growing up. So what can I do? <laughs> Try to, I don't want him to make the same mistakes I did. Corey is a very good father. Corey is there for Tylus all the time. And family is very important. You gotta know your people. If you don't know your people, you don't know where you come from. The activity that we're gonna try to do today is one that a lot of people perhaps do not sometimes feel comfortable about because they're dealing with part of their, what I call their deep culture. You're gonna learn some rhythms that are already in you. We just gotta make them bubble to the surface. Drummer and educator Wayne Hamilton challenged us in more ways than one. The drums help some guys in the room feel connected to something that's bigger than themselves. I need you guys to try this first pattern. Boom, boom. It fades. You gotta listen for it. You gotta listen. No, listen. Listen. What? Yeah, that's, that's, you should get this one. This one's easier. The drumming bonds us as brothers to the greatness of Africa, where all humanity began. You guys are good. Enjoy over right here. This is basketball now. My man likes to dunk it and stuff. Oh, nice shot! Yay! That was only going in grade ten when I met him. Yeah. So I was still pretty young. <laughs> Man, we were both only going in grade eleven. Yeah. There ain't no difference. I know. I'm just saying. We were counting animals. Do you want to go to another page? Hell, am I gonna tell my mom? That was my first thought. <laughs> um, that went better than I expected, though. Me, my coat with it was like, damn. I was like, oh shit. Man, I got a little man coming into the world. I was very, um, very disappointed because I always told them guys to wrap it up, but they don't. <laughs> they don't listen. I'm living my life through him. These are the cards that I collected for him. It does got the spinning rims. Core is so young, so, so young. I'm only 20, yeah. Uh, I guess it was depending on how Tanya felt. If you want to be with me, I'm going to have Tylus. If you don't want to be with me, then I'm not going to have the baby. But they went, they went through with it and uh, and I thank God for him because now we got a Tylus. 
and I stepped up to the plate. <laughs> I had to hit that home run, you know what I mean? <laughs> Bring the family home. Can you pop up? Can you come close the door, please? Okay. All right, thank you. I will see you over at the Boys and Girls Club. But I still talk to my friends every now and then, but I don't hang as much with the people I used to hang with. I want you to record him doing a donut, because that's what we were just doing a second ago. All right, cool. Man, what if our niggas is grounded? Girl ain't letting me go. Now, the boys will consider you being on lockdown if your girl keeps you in the hoes. Like, you saying you ain't lied over. At the beginning, yeah, I was getting clowned. Everybody was like, yo, man, look at you staying in the house. You a host, man. I'm like, nah, it ain't even that, man. It's just that I have respect for my girlfriend and I have the love for my child. I'd rather be in the host than me just going in and drinking and just hanging up. So what you want to know? <laughs> yeah, at the start of this, he says, when, when the baby first came out, yeah, he was locked down. But you got to expect that, though, you know what I mean? The baby just come out. Of course, he wants him to, you know, do his thing. <laughs> I don't know who's going to see this, see? I got to be careful what I'm saying. I don't want to get my man in trouble. <laughs> I used to look up to him and Curtis, his older brother, all the time. You know, I know Corey prior since about grade three, so add up the years, whatever. Our family's been through struggles together, you know, going through hard times. We rap together, chill together, cut girls together, cut that crowd out. Go to the club with them, go chill with girls with them, drink with them. I got into a fight with them twice. But you know, everything brought us closer together and now we're pretty much like family. Is it your way? All right, You're welcome. I bet Anton a, a free beer that he won't grab her ass. So just come back. I'm not coming for he'll do it. Nah, I'm not trying to go to jail. Remember that time we went to uh, Cape Breton? You know, all of us went to that girl's house. Yeah, there was right. like five. Yo, there was five men standing on the woman's lawn, pissing on her host <laughs> on the tree. I wouldn't them too. <laughs> <laughs> my mother could never afford to buy me the best things in life, you know what I mean? So, in turn, I had to do what I had to do to make it for myself to get these better things. I just want to be better than the next man. It felt like it was a, a self-esteem thing. Remember that old fellow with the boom saying, do you know how smoking that hair? I thought I wouldn't be accepted as just the normal Corey. I had to be known as the hustling Corey, you know what I mean? The one that's just straight up sucking people in, you know what I mean? Man, hustling is you do whatever you have to do to get a couple dollars in your pocket. Me hustling you is me either selling you something or me saying I'm gonna do a favor for you and I'm just, <laughs> I'm making money and you're just, you're either getting satisfied by getting high or you're just, getting sucked in, plain and simple. Crack, tobacco, gambling, heroin, steroids, alcohol, ecstasy. I tell you what, I done about all of them. Michael Mantley knows all about hustling. He left decades of drugs and crime behind. Now he works helping others cope with addiction. Michael asked us to look beyond drugs and crime as circumstances and causes, and he asked us to do it without guilt or shame. I want to tell you a story about yourself using me as the example. I was 13 years old when I had my first drink, and it was also my first drunk. And at that particular time, I did a, a volley of other drugs. I did acid. I did PCP. And I was 18 when I first snorted cocaine. I dropped out of school in grade 10. 
I never finished school. Growing up poor, having to be hard, and not having many mentors. They are all still in school, even though half of them have been suspended. They believe they are the first target in any conflict. As a result, they have taken on negativity and cynicism. Michael wants them to know that they have alternatives. My brothers, I say to you today, whatever you do in your life, or whatever you do with your life, you have the ability, you have the power to become anything that you want to be. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I was on a suicide mission. I was dying. I had no self-esteem. I had no will to live. I didn't have the guts to go get a gun and blow my head off. No money left, smoke crack all night. Paranoid as freak, scared. A sister in Salvation Army used to give me Bible references. So I got up off the bed, brushed myself off. A piece of paper fell, white, and I opened it and it said, This is no joke. The scripture said, devil comes but to steal, to ruin, to destroy, to kill. But I, Jesus, <laughs> I'm sorry, I come that you would have life, that you would have it more abundantly. That's my scripture. Thank you. I love you, brother. Corey moved to the suburbs when he was 12, leaving behind his best friends and his community. In the suburb, it's everyone for themselves. So I decided to embrace the people that were out there. So I turned to drugs and that's when I started selling. And then as soon as I started selling, it seemed like everybody wanted to be my friend. Everybody looked up to me saying, oh yeah, you're doing this, you're doing that. And like, so they're like admiring me. And when you're in the spotlight, everybody loves that. This is where I used to make my money at. This is the main area where, you know, I used to walk down around the corner. There used to be a store at the end of this path. And this is where I used to make all my money at. I used to take my dog for a walk, that's what I used to tell my mother, but I wasn't taking, really, my main purpose wasn't to take him for a walk, my main purpose was to go get some money, so. A lot of kids were over here. There's nothing really else to do. There's no community centers and nothing that the kids can really go to. So, what they, would they rather do? Get drunk and high. Can you blame them? I can't, because I was one of them, you know what I mean? So what type of stuff did you used to do here? Uh, a little bit of ecstasy, a little bit of weed, you know, whatever I got my hands on, shrooms. And whatever anybody needed, I was trying to do it. You know how, how you find this and that, and in the back of your mind, you know what's going on, but you just say, not my child. Well, I think he was uh, 15 or 16 years old. It was actually on his birthday. And I found little bags. When you see little bags about this big, and there's about five or six of them, you know that it's not for your own use. 
so the tears started running. I started praying, and I dumped it all down the toilet. I had like, like almost three ounces of dope, all bagged up, ready to go. You know what I mean? Ready for to get sold. I come back home, everything was sprawled on my bed, every baggie emptied out. Not even enough to roll myself a joint to calm my head down. Needless to say, the confrontation came when Corey come in and we were fighting. Mom, that was hundreds of dollars, la la la. I took the hollering. Didn't curse at her though. That was one thing I would never do. I didn't curse at my mom. I knew that what I did was the right thing because he needed a, a big wake up call. And, and that was it. I realized I hurt my mother's feelings because she was seeing her son go the wrong way and everything like that. But. That was just the, the path I was choosing for them. I think he, he just, I don't, he just handled it. You have to ask him how he handled it. I don't know how he handled it. I just know that uh, we had our talk and I told him that I wasn't letting him go that way. And I had to <laughs> seriously just make what I just lost back pretty much. And I ended up, I sold it again. It didn't stop me. But the thing is though, I didn't keep it in the house. You know, I kept I kept it outside in our in our um, shed. I talked to his father when I I had the um, the notion that Corey was involved in this, and his father was well well he knew about these things more so than I did. Okay, so when he said, and I said, you better talk to your son because I don't know what to do, and I think this is this and this is that. And he told me, he said, well, Rose, next time you find it, flush it down the toilet. Your mom told us that your dad's the one that told her to flush it. That bastard. <laughs> I didn't know that. Never, ever knew that. How do you feel about that? That's crazy. He shouldn't have told her that. That's my money, man. But, um, damn, that's a surprise, really. What can I say on it? Nothing. Just like, damn, I wish you wouldn't have told her that. Really? I want the car, that would have been money in my pocket. Corey's mom and dad split up when he was eight years old. Corey lived with his mom and his three older siblings. His dad was around but not very often. I always respect my father. He brought me into this world. Was, I know it was a hard situation for my father to adapt and like not being able to just come visit us and chill in the house and let, like, you know what I mean? Just spend time with us in that sense, rather than having to come pick us up and then take us somewhere and then relax and then take us back home, so. Maybe that's why my dad wasn't that involved in our lives. Nothing else I can do about that. I still gotta love him regardless of what he does. And I still love him for anything he does anyway. I'm glad he's shown love. That's it. It hurt. It hurt when I, when I left him. They cried for a while and they always asked the mother where his dad at. It was just like... I, my father ain't around as much, but I still always got my mother, so I saw him every now and then. So it didn't really, it didn't affect me as much as it could have, you know what I mean? Because he always, no matter what, he still make time for to come around and check us out. Whether it be to just come through and give us a little kick in the ass, or give us a hug, or give us a kiss, or, you know what I mean? So and also give you a little grab and tell you what are you doing with your life? You don't need it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you said that, that I didn't need to do that stuff. Cause better than that. You don't. He told me the consequences of what I was doing and why I shouldn't be doing it, why I'm capable of doing other things, right? I can be his father, his friend, and then, then there's discipline, and then there's law. So I'd rather be the father and the friend than rather get him disciplined and, and, go, and end up in the law. And I figured it's time I have to try to scare him. Do you think it worked? Yes. <laughs> Do you think it worked for you? Most part. But still, that fear didn't really stop me sometimes, though. Because I'm big I ain't going to lie to you. I'm stubborn. If I want something, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get that. But now, my approach at it is more legal than illegal. So. 
That's the only difference. So how do you think Bury is as a father? Oh, he's good. But sometimes I have to look at him and just give him that eye. No, you don't do that. Like, when he scolds his son, I'm not supposed to be there, you know, to tell him, but I do it. No, you don't do it this way, you do it this way. Right? But you know, that's my way of doing it, though. Yeah. That's, where I, that's what we it's always not say, not too, always, it's not always. It's not always the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Dog? I got you. Come on, let's walk to the car. Are we gonna go get our hair cut? Come on this way. We gonna get our hair cut? I stay around so he can have a father. Like the typical family, you know what I mean? Daddy! You're almost done, buddy. There's nothing wrong with like growing up with either your father or your mother. Good? You good, Ty? Yeah. But um, I just want to provide that, that scene with my son. Two things. Two things. So he has his mother and his father around all the time. Best of both worlds. Yeah. Talus is now in daycare. Tanya is working in a call center. Corey is attending a transitional program at Dalhousie University. Oh, you don't want me to pull up the pistol on you, do you? Hey, 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 that's not. I'm not gonna try to sugarcoat the world for him. I'm gonna let him know, like, these are the wrong paths that I was going down, but I turned around. I did like a 180 turn just because of my responsibilities and how my life would have been if I would have stayed on that path. Do you want a piece of your dirty? <laughs> you bust it up. Buster! Punk. Punk. I'm not gonna like put a blindfold on him and say, oh, this stuff isn't around you. I'm gonna let him know it. I'll bust you up, Buster. I'll bust you up, Buster, Daddy. I bet you can. But at the same time, I'm gonna like be there to guide him through these things. I'm gonna be my son's friend. I want to be his best friend. But when it boils down to it, if I gotta discipline you, I'm gonna do it. If I see him hanging around with the wrong crowd and he's getting into a lot of trouble, then obviously I'm gonna step in and say something to him. I get something that he can focus his energy on in a positive way, like in, in him, making him more productive. <laughs> he's gonna beat you up anyways. But he don't. You punk. Ah, you can't reach me. <laughs> I was used to living the life of spending money whenever I wanted to or doing whatever I wanted to. Doing whatever and whenever I wanted to, really. But it was easy for me to break it. My son made me change my mind. So when I saw it, when I found out that I was having a child, I was like, what can I do? <laughs> Is it going to be be a father or am I going to be in jail? Am I going to have a little quick money in my pocket or be broke for the meantime? So what I chose is to be a father and be broke for the meantime and see what <laughs> see what ravels over me. Corey started coaching at the Dartmouth Boys and Girls Club. The same club he's been going to since he was a kid. The older generation gave me the opportunity to play basketball. So I wanted to give back that same feeling to these kids. Yeah. 
but it's better if you use your own judgment. I can't leave kids around this neighborhood high and dry and not have a, like a good role model to kind of look up to. I want to lead an example, so I can't tell my kids to do one thing and then me turn around and do what I told them not to do, you know what I mean? A lot of people nowadays my age, they just wanna, they wanna live the fast lane and stuff. I lived the fast lane myself and I had to change my ways because of my son. I don't wanna see these kids growing up to even think that fast cash is the way to go. Where you can go a legit way and still get more out of life. Learning through my, like my family's experience and learning from what I've, like, knew as a kid, like saw as a kid and everything like that, it's just a part of me. The little details of, of like say, whoever was hustling like weed on the street, the little, the, their body language, their, their behavior and their, like the way they approach things, I picked up on that stuff. I just been used to it for so long that it's just, it's just a part of me. Like no matter what, I always have the hustling mentality. Everything's a hustle, man. What anybody does is sort of like a hustle. It's just whether you do it positively or negatively. The retreat's over. The guys might not feel the full impact right away, but they have more to believe in. They have a stronger sense of themselves and the brotherhood. We had a couple of hiccups from the beginning. You guys know that it was originally, it was postponed and then it got put forward. Well, that was because I lost my baby girls, all right? And uh, it was really hard time in my life and uh, my brothers sat there and supported me, right? The thing that I learned about my, my twins when I held them in my arms is the potential. And uh, you guys all have the potential. They, had, they, they weren't able to, to reach their full potential. You guys have all the abilities that you ever had to, to do anything you want, right? To have all the potential in the world. Don't waste it, man. Don't waste your potential. That is, listen to the biz, my apple still a frizz Roller skating at the wheelies almost every single weekend Showing on the moves on the side, peeps freaking Good times I was seeking, you couldn't move me over Guy had me jamming, Levert's Casanova The king of the mountain, I always used to win Right from the begin, I could pull a backspin The clown of the class would always make a pass Love letters to the girls, cause I always love the ass Kiss her on the cheek, or maybe on the hand But never understood love, and still to understand I had a Michael Jackson glove and a Michael Jackson jacket Rapping those school rhymes over Fizz's beatbox racket Never had a dad, but my mama took care Raised as a strong black man with no fear Say this is for when I'm older Ow. Walk up to the camera and say this is for when I'm older I'm older